Chris Nielsen. Um, I'm with the California Nurses Association, the National Nurses United. We're co-sponsoring this event with the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine. And in just a second, I'll turn the time over to Seth Holmes, co-director of the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine, and he'll introduce our fantastic speakers uh, today. So uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words really briefly before we get started about who National Nurses United is and you know why we're working with the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine on this talk series. It's called uh, Social Medicine for Our Times. And uh, this event, uh, Latin American Social Medicine Then and Now, is uh, the fourth event in this series. So we've, uh, up to this point, we've talked about the health effects of disaster capitalism in Puerto Rico after the hurricane. We've talked about uh, struggles for racial justice and health justice and how those connect. We've talked about um, how we can, uh, how we can address the health effects of you know, resurgent xenophobia and uh, anti-immigrant politics. Uh, here in the U.S. and today, as you all know, we'll be talking about uh, struggles for health justice in Latin America and in particular the, the tradition of Latin American social medicine. So why are we doing this as a union? Well, we as a union, we understand that we can't just advocate for the interests of our nurses alone. We have to advocate for the interests of all working people and poor folks everywhere. We can't just advocate for the uh, health of our patients in order to do that. Uh, nurses understand because of their kind of holistic view and approach to health care that you also, that, that patient care can't end at the bedside, that you have to go out and address the underlying root causes of uh, their patients' health problems, the social causes, the economic causes, the political causes. And so, um, you know, that's the kind of work we do. That's why we're involved in social movements for Medicare for All, why we're involved in social movements for climate justice, for racial justice. Um, and we're also very heavily involved in you know, various educational initiatives uh, where we try to you know, deepen the understanding of both our nurses as well as activists and community members about these social and structural uh, roots of health and, and health inequalities. And um, so we do that through a number of different means, through continuing education for our nurses, popular political education for um, activists and community allies, we have um, online uh, education programs where we partner with different universities, uh, with their students and with our own nurses to deepen their understanding around these things. Uh, if you have more uh, questions about that, you can talk to me afterward and I can and tell you more about that. But I want to go ahead and, and move this along since um, we got started a little late. So um, I'm going to go ahead and just turn the time over to Seth and just say that we're really grateful to be working with, this, uh, with the Center for Social Medicine on this project. So thanks. Thank you, Chris. So I'm Seth Holmes. I'm an associate professor of society and environment and medical <coughs> anthropology and co-chair with Charles Briggs of the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine. And um, it's been a fun and informative and inspiring lecture series focused on social medicine for our times where we've been trying to bring together scholars, activists, and community members and practitioners who are all dealing with something that's really important right now related to health and social justice. Um, so my job is to introduce the fabulous panel we have. And the introductions are a little bit long because they're fabulous. Um, and, but I'll try not to talk too long. My other job is to ask you to silence your cell phones and to let you know that the plan is that each of the presenters will present for five to 10 minutes um, about social medicine, Latin American social medicine then and now. Then we'll have a few questions from me, kind of moderated discussion, and then we'll open it up to questions from you all. So if there's a way for you to um, plan a question that'll help kind of conversation move forward, that would be great. Um, so for nearly a century, Latin American health practitioners have been at the forefront of innovating responses to social inequities. Emphasizing praxis, which is the combination of social theory and political practice, Adherents of Latin American social medicine have participated in many of the region's social justice movements. Salvador Allende, a pathologist and late president of Chile, played a key role in establishing this field with his path-breaking work in epidemiology. This served as the foundation of his presidency until his death in the 1973 U.S.-supported military coup. While Latin American social medicine has become a widely respected field, its accomplishments remain less known in the English-speaking world. And that's part of why the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine and California Nurses Association wanted to put on this event. And it's also why we want to remind you that tomorrow, 
Um, there will be another event with Dr. Jaime Breil with responses from Associate Professor Amani Nurujeter, the a social epidemiologist from the School of Public Health, and Professor Nancy Peluso, the Professor of Political Ecology here from Berkeley. Um, the title of which is... <laughs> Toward Health and Environmental Liberation, Insights from Latin American Critical Epidemiology. Thanks. So, and that will be in the building across the way where there is a projector that's built into the room. It's in Kroeber Hall, it's on the second floor. Um, get there a little bit early because it, everyone might not fit, but we're excited about it. So first to introduce um, our esteemed visitor, Jaime Breo Pasi Muno. Um, he's the recent past president of the Ecuadorian Academy of Medicine and is the rector of the Universidad Andina Simón Bolívar as well as the director of the PhD in Collective Health, Environment, and Society in partnership with the University of British Columbia and runs an Andean Observatory on Collective Health, Environment, and Society, considering such important topics as climate change, capitalism, and agrochemicals. He's founder and coordinator of the first doctorate in health in Ecuador and has worked with many universities throughout the continent um, setting up research programs. He's known internationally as one of the founders of the scientific discipline of Latin American critical epidemiology. He's the co-founder of the Latin American Association of Social Medicine and Collective Health. The author of 21 books and co-author of 61 books in Spanish, Portuguese, English, and French. And the author of more than 100 articles in Spanish, Portuguese, English, and German. His work has made significant pioneering contributions to theories of the social determination of health, which if you pay attention, you'll note, is different in focus and politics and analysis than a focus on the social determinants of health. He has also worked in the history of thought in relation to health, um, developing an ecosystem approach to health and critical epidemiological theories. Dr. Braille has also pioneered innovations in research creating instruments for participatory monitoring, monitoring, such as the stress scale that's now used for research on the social determination of stress, and a system for participatory research on neuro and psychotoxic exposure to pesticides, incorporating these monitoring standards to ensure appropriate international agricultural practices. He's received numerous honorary degrees from universities in Latin America, North America, and Europe, as well as received numerous research prizes nationally and internationally. We're excited that he's here. Dorothy Porter is professor of the history of health sciences at the University of California, San Francisco. She's published extensively on the history of public health and social medicine. Um, two of her books are Health Citizenship, Essays on Social Medicine and Biomedical Politics, and Health, Civilization, and the State, A History of Public Health from Ancient to Modern Times. She's also edited and co-edited several volumes related to the history of public health. <coughs> Dr. Porter has published over 60 articles on the history of health citizenship, biomedical politics, ancestry, genetics, and eugenics, and the experience of health and illness during the Enlightenment, as well as ontology and emergence in neuromolecular science and disease. She's published in academic journals in history, historical sociology, literary studies, and in medical journals, including The Lancet, The British Medical Journal, The New England Journal of Medicine, The Journal of the American Medical Association, and in the Social Medicine in the 21st Century Special itch Issue, which I was honored to co-edit in the Public Library of Science Medicine. She's currently researching the history of Parkinson's disease and creativity. And maybe I should say that her article in that special issue on social medicine of the Public Library of Science Medicine is about the history of social medicine globally. Clara Martini Briggs was trained as a physician in Venezuela. Where did she go? Oh. <laughs> and received public health degrees from the Universidad Central de Venezuela and from the Johns Hopkins University. After working for the Ministry of Health of Venezuela with indigenous populations in Amazonas and Delta Amacuro State, she served as national director of the Dengue Fever Program. She's published numer numerous articles on health in Latin America and is co-author with Charles Briggs of Stories in the Time of Cholera, Racial Profiling During a Medical Nightmare, which won the J.I. Staley and Bryce Wood Awards, as well as Narrativas Patologicas 
patológicas y epidemias de discriminación hacia la población Guarao, la epidemia de cólera y los indígenas como ciudadanos de segunda en Venezuela. Pardon my accent. Um, as well as Tell Me Why My Children Died, Rabies, Indigenous Knowledge, and Communicative Justice, which recently was awarded the New Millennium Book Award from the Society for Medical Anthropology. Dr. Mantini Briggs teaches in the Department of Anthropology at the University of California, Berkeley, and is an, an affiliated faculty member in residence at the Berkeley Center for Social Medicine. Fernando Lozada began his career in the Black Belt region of the southeastern United States, organizing community clinics and worker centers in the mid-1980s. After a decade organizing factories with the United Electrical Workers in North Carolina and California, Losada joined the staff of the California Nurses Association in 2001. He's currently collective bargaining director for CNA's National Nurses Organizing Committee and National Nurses United. Through his work at CNA and National Nurses United, he's also played a key role organizing Global Nurses United, of which NNU is a member, traveling throughout Latin America to collaborate with major nurse unions, fighting the impacts of neoliberal capitalist restructuring in their countries and globally. And Luther Castillo Pardi, um, I've seen in a movie, but I haven't met yet. Okay, oh, I'm excited to. Received his MD and specialization in family medicine from the Latin American School of Medicine in Havana, Cuba, and master's in public health, um, no, master's in public administration from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard. He's the founder and director of the first Garifuna Hospital of Honduras and founder and advisor of the first community hospital of San Jose de Culinas, Honduras. In 2010, Dr. Castillo served as director and coordinator of the Cuban-led International Medical Brigade for the Haitian earthquake, leading a medical team of 728 doctors from 26 countries, providing medical services to the Haitian people. He was a leader in the opposition to the brutal 2009 coup in Honduras and has played a key role in bringing international attention to the violence of the current dictatorship of Juan Orlando Hernandez in, the, in his country of origin. He's also held various positions in Honduras, including Director of Foreign Cooperation for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Coordinator of the National Presidential Committee on Primary Health Care, and National Health Commissioner. And recently he served as campaign advisor to Costa Rican political S.B. Cam Campbell Barr, the first black woman vice president to be elected in all of the Americas. So we have a super interesting panel. And we'll start with our esteemed Dr. Jaime Brel. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you very much for the privilege of being here. Um, many thanks to Charles Briggs and his colleagues at the Department of Anthropology at UC Berkeley for the opportunity and privilege of participating in this colloquium in social medicine with Drs. Dorothy Porter, Clara Mantini, Briggs, Luther Castillo, and Fernando Lozada. <clears throat> uh, let me start with, uh, with uh, some news, sad news from my country. My small, beautiful, peaceful country, Ecuador, where in the 21st century, three neoliberal governments were overthrown without violence, where our social and academic movements uh, were victorious in the struggle for a new constitution, that consecrates the preeminence of human rights over big business interests, that honors an intercultural philosophy of equitable, good living, uh, and the rights of nature, has been subject in recent weeks to the attack and blackmail by a criminal band formed by a dissident fraction of the Colombian FARC, equipped with modern arms and military resources. <coughs> They are trying to penetrate in Ecuador and open a new traffic territory, protect the, it as a Praetorian guard of transnational drug cartel operations, and so have kidnapped and murdered three Ecuadorian journalists who were investigating their previous terrorist attacks to our military precincts, where four of our soldiers were also killed. The world must know about this, and for this reason, I take the opportunity of this presentation to dedicate 
my participation in the colloquium to the memory of my, of my fallen countrymen. One, one more sign of the profound global crisis of the greedy capitalist societies that this well-informed hu uh, human right conscious audience needs to know in this magnificent university known for the history for, for its history and spirit of dignity uh, I took the liberty to, to mention this because I was shocked when I read uh, uh, news in the New York Times saying that a Marxist guerrilla have, is involved nothing to do with a Marxist guerrilla this is a, this is a criminal band of murderers of people that are that are the Praetorian guards of, of capitalist drug uh, drug uh, transnationals. But I would also like to dedicate these reflections to the thousands of organized nurses. I have a very special place in my heart for nurses. Let me tell you, uh, because uh, I have been working since I was very young with in the for, in the struggle with the nurses, and also learn and always learned that they were one of the one of the strata of, of the medical uh, professions that, are, that are have great social awareness and very and a profound human sensitivity. Uh, nurses that speak out on labor and patient rights and work as educators, researchers, <coughs> or caretakers and critical historians also that work to unveil the long journey of structural unhealthiness of our societies and struggle with their people as key lifeline of human values. Briefly, uh, I have only 10 minutes. I would like you to help me when I have three more minutes. Please, God, if you be so kind. Um, the conceptual premises, first of all, for a critical approach to the history of health sciences, the historical conceptual framework of the university reform movements in Latin America, and the development of the Latin American social medicine movement. Uh, some conceptual premises for a critical approach to the history of health sciences. Uh, it, I'm highlighting this, the importance of critical radical thinking. And uh, this, this means, for one, to deconstruct and reinvent epistemological certainties, to discern and unveil relationships between mechanisms of coercion of knowledge, to interrogate the politics of truth and question truth as it operates through power, transgressing one's limits and deconstructing those limits to your subjecthood, and desubjugate the subjugation of the subject. This is very powerful, uh, a very powerful conception of critical thinking. And I have to say that we must complete the cycle of an emancipatory critique not only criticizing the epistemic or cultural conditions, which is, would be an incomplete and uprooted process, uh, because emancipatory criticism applies to the material basis, the civilization and the epistemological cultural basis that support it. I am, I am stressing the, the fact that scientific models with their specific understanding of, of problems and processes are profoundly linked to the interpretative specialized systems or paradigms, and these paradigms operate in relation to intellectual, cultural, fashions, visible dominant ideas or forbidden ideas of the of the of this of the society's epistem. And of course all this is embedded in a profound uh, struggle of social relations and and, and power power conflicts. So a comprehensive view of critical thinking implies a philosophy of living that questions the material objective and the cultural subjective fundaments of a society. Therefore, it questions the mode of dominant social reproduction and its civilization. It implies a broad intercultural meta-critique and concomitantly it questions the dominant practices and ethos of society. So from this approach, I would say that the axis of historical critical analysis would imply looking at health as an object, the, uh, the historical, the historicity of the, ob of the health as an object, meaning the unhealthy existing conditions of persons and societies, 
This, the history of health related ideas of individual and collective subjects and the paradigm crashes that occur in that field and then the health related individual and collective practices so the the ontological the, the epistemological and the practical and the praxis of, of history of health is very important I would like to highlight one, one important idea of this criti critical approach that in the case of Ecuador, in the case of many of the Latin American countries, uh, the the awareness or the or the advancement, the the, the, the fast track development of, of critical ideas in science in the health sciences, occur in revolutionary periods. The colonial independence was linked in the twenty in the in the seventeenth century, the anti colonial struggle with the powerful ideas of Eugenio Espejo. The Julian Revolution of uh, of the early the 20s 30s of the 20th century, the struggle against the oligarchic state, where the the, the powerful thinking of Ricardo Paredes and Pablo Arturo Suarez, and in the capital acceleration neoproductivism, uh, the struggle against capital acceleration and neoproductivism, the collective health movement that that started in the 70s and 80s. So we're talking about. <coughs> A do, the domains of critical science and health, which is a critical ontology, a critical epistemology, and a critical praxis, which means that the, 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 the critical approach to understanding the historical movement of the material base, the mode of social reproduction and collective modes of living, then the scope uh, the civilization, the culture, the theoretical and mythological conceptions that, that are, are interwined with that material base, and the emancipatory or regressive practices that, that occur in that society. All these are inter interdependent uh, processes. The historical conceptual framework of university for movements in Latin America is clearly linked to the movement of the, the next one please of the universal reform a movement that started in Cordoba, Argentina in, in 1928 uh, uh, 18, 18 and uh, this is a this is a reform movement that is uh, uh, celebrating its 100 years that we're celebrating in whole Latin America this reform movement of of uh, 1918, which was the first university reform movement at the University of Cordoba, with a student and, and workers uprising against the monastic bookish self-centered order that would have been imposed in the universities at that time. That movement stated the principles of autonomy, of superior education, faculty and student co-government, university extension programs, faculty positions chaired by merit and not by, by designation of powerful groups, free education, worker-student unity. This, of course, was 1918. From then, from then on, these this hundred years that have uh, had, uh, passed by, we are now in many universities in Latin America where we're having international encounters to, to update this, this kind of tr a critical tradition of, of reflection. And of course, in this historical panorama, the superior education reform, the historical panorama implied in the 16th and the, and the 17th centuries, the, the, the struggle uh, the, against the absolutist and theocratic imposed scholasticism. In the 18th century, the first half of the 18th century, the scholastic vision gave way to the humanist of enlightenment. In the 18th century, second half, the winds of independence push forward a paradigm of enlightenment. The, the 19th century power groups are struggling for individual liberties, position the romantic nationalist perspective, denouncing extreme social inequality. 20th century, early 20th century, the first university movement with the students uprising and workers uprising against, against uh, as we have mentioned. The 20th century, in the 20th century, in the 70s, the second university reform movement the struggle against inequity, ideas of Darcy, like the ideas of Darcy Ribeiro in Brazil, of Aníbal Ponce in Argentina, of Pablo Freire in Brazil also, and Manuel Agustín Aguirre in Ecuador. 
the end of the 20th century and the 21st centuries, the struggle for autonomy to face techno-bureaucratic functionalism and post-academic, and this, what it has been called a post-academic uh, stand of, of universities uh, recently. This means that we are facing now new, new, we are defining new, new uh, problems, and we, in the case of, of many of the, of the uh, Latin American countries, so-called progressive, we are finding that some of those societies where supposedly progressive governments have been ruling um, really face a real a technocratic and, and neo-productivist uh, model of society that is imposed on, on certain, certain roles on the universities. So in Latin America, the historical debate expresses a broad scope of critical epistemologies of all sorts. We have, even though there is a decolonial need of, uh, 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 there is a need to decolonize uh, and, and, and this Eurocentric science that had, that had been imposed uh, from early times to our, to our uh, university thinking. But we, we understand that in the North and, and Europe and in the North there have been very important uh, uh, paradigms of, of critical thinking that, that, that have to be taken into consideration in this, in this uh, developments that we're talking about. The development of Latin American social medicine, uh, we call it collective health movement. Um, to imply that this is not a public health movement, this is not a conventional population's health movement, it's a collective health movement that has other uh, epistemological, methodological, and practical implications. And uh, in an in intent to very briefly per periodize the Latin American social medicine movement, I think that we can, we can, we, we find a formative period, I, you will, I, I don't. I'm. You will not, would not. Won't see the details. Next one, please. The formative. There is a formative period in the 70s. There is a, a, a a diversification period, where in the in the 80s, a consolidation period in the 90s, and a consolidation of a platform of public social agency and scientific. Metacritic in the in the in the in the early years in the recent years. So, I think I, I won't go into the details of this movement. But what I need to uh, to say is that probably being in the in the subordinated world of the South, um, academic the academic world, the academic spaces, and the academic uh, struggles of, of of Latin America were were very very early uh, uh, linked to the movement, to the movements of, of social and political struggle. Universities were not isolated from that, and I think that all this, this in this in each one of these stages, like in the first case, the in the formative period, the rupture against formal bio biomedical model, the initial deconstruction of positivism and empirical methodology works on class analysis, the initial works on class analysis, initial critique of functionalist behaviorist social sciences, and the first social medicine postgraduate programs that occurred in the 70s. In the 80s, the struggle against neoliberal and state policies and privatization, the founding works on gender and ethnicity, applied specifically to the, to the struggles of public health, the gender and ethnocultural components on postgraduate programs that are, that were strengthened in the 90s. In the in the 90s, the the generalized ethnic, gender, urban, social movements that were linked to to postgraduate programs, the consolidation of critical interculturality, dialogue of knowledges um, and practices in collective health, the um, the constituent projects of uh, of or for the new constitution in various countries, that that was a there's enormous historical exercise of, of of linking the struggles of the peoples with the struggles of the universities, the abandonments on on the health system reform, the conduction of important uh, uh, universities the in in high high government 
uh, of university members of, in high government positions. And finally, in recent years, the demand for a new civilization, what I have called the four S's of life that I will develop in my talk tomorrow, which implies the, a link of, of an academic critical thinking with the, with the summa causa philosophy of the indigenous Andean people that implies a uh, construction or uh, a questioning of the capitalist civilization from the from the perspective of the of the profound needs of the or what what we call the forests of life uh, the a pluricultural democracy the, the the principles of a pluricultural democracy reframing regional integration uh, a transdisciplinary intercultural emancipatory knowledge and the methodology uh, in the in the recon, in the cons methodological theoretical construction of social of me metacriticism, so I think that the the challenge of of intercultural knowledge is is is, is crucial, and I think that um, it is very important to take into con con consideration that this convergence of academic and indigenous critical thinking academic the convergence of academic and critical thinking that can be expressed when we when we read the words of we are now in celebrating also before I, I mentioned this we are now celebrating uh, the, the 100 years of the Cordoba reform in various universities in, in Latin America in our university in Quito we are going to hold this meeting which is a preparatory uh, stage of discussion about the profound reform that has to face this neo-productivism wave that is that is uh, that is uh, pushed by even supposedly progressive governments that think that there is a, that there is a, a possibility of extractivism and mining and and, and and oil exploitation, which would be supposedly uh, there would be a good extractivism because it has social purposes in it. This contradiction that I will work in in, in another moment. I think is, is, is very important to, to denounce and to and to face from the universities. Let's see. Let's see. So we, we have this objective uh, to discuss the postgraduate university model in the fields of social sciences, humanities, and life sciences in the context of the crisis of progressivism, the expansion of extractivism, the challenges of overcoming the dominant paradigm of a technocratic higher education. Functional, which which would operate as a functional branch and uncritical, with the aim of clarifying the intercultural and creative transdisciplinarity in light of the legacy of the Cordoba reforms. Next, please. Next, please. Next. Okay. So what I meant, in just to finish, is this: this, the the wisdom of our indigenous grandfathers and grandmothers. To strive for life and nature, you need a critical spirit, but also love. It is not only a problem of logos, of of, uh, of right right hemisphere, but it's all it's a, of left hemisphere is a problem of of, of love, of, of sensitivity. Health is built not only from deep justice, but also from deep love, and uh, the human and sensible approach towards our territory that is part of the unity of life. And this is very important that this this. This thinking of the of our indigenous grandfathers, the next one, is linked to the to the to the, to, to the thinking of important critical scientists, sound important scientists like Einstein that said a human being is part of the whole of the of the whole called by us universe as part of limited in time and space. He experiences himself his thoughts and as something separated from from the from the rest and a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole nature in its beauty. Nobody is able to achieve this completely, but the striving for such achievement is in itself part of the liberation and, and a foundation for inner security. Both this thinking from the indigenous South and from the powerful, critical, emancipatory North have to be part of this struggle to save this planet from the brutality, from the greedy uh, brutality of capitalism that is now destroying 
not only life in itself, but also the thinking of human beings and is, is having some, some serious implications in the reframing and the rebuilding and the re-engineering of universities that were critical, in, that were profoundly critical and now have become tamed and, uh, uh, and have accepted that to be a successful peer review contest and, competi and, and, and academic competitivity is the, is the road to, to, to the progress of science. That is the road to hell. And I think that, I think that we must be very careful and do and, and save our universities and struggle because all these young people that are now learning in, in, in our programs have to receive uh, a, a, a vaccination against this tremendous uh, um, failure that can happen if we obey the laws of capitalist reproduction. Thank you. All right, Professor Dorothy Porter. And I'll encourage the other people on the panel to make their 10 minutes be more like 10 minutes. <laughs> I'm not sure I've ever had to follow such an extraordinary account in paper as has just been given by our most eminent guest, um, Professor Bray, was really astonishing. And I can only say that I am honored and humbled to be invited amongst such a distinguished panel, including, of course, our, our um, eminent um, intellectual, but you know, the rest of the panel too. Um, I have a very small <laughs> contribution really to make to this, which is um, to explain why um, I, I don't, first of all, I, I, have to, I have to confess straight away that I don't read or speak Spanish. So although I became extremely fascinated with the history of Latin American social medicine, I couldn't research it from primary sources myself, I relied on the, on the English translation of excellent um, Latin American scholars who informed me about it. Um, but once I um, discovered it, it became essential to my um, own understanding of what I had been researching, which was the history of social medicine in um, the Anglo-American context. And really what I was trying to investigate at that time was what Professor Bray described as the taming process, the taming process of critique. Because social medicine, even in the 19th century with um, Rudolf Virchow, which, who was hardly you know, um, a revolutionary um, figure, but even he identified in 1848 that um, uh, population ill health was the result of political subjugation. <laughs> and that, and that, and, you know, he, he went and researched, the, uh, you know, typhus in Upper Silesia, and said, well, of course, the, well, the reason for this is Prussian colonialism. That's why typhus is. That's why typhus is rampant amongst this um, impoverished and um, politically subjugated population, and and, and the, the the relief of suffering and the overcoming of of um, epidemic disease is political emancipation, and and I wanted to trace, uh, uh, at the, you know, when I was still researching the history of social medicine, how that um, conceptualization of what social medicine should, how it should function how that um, changed um, in the Anglo-American context from um, a, sort of, a sort of intellectual movement driven um, in the uh, uh, late 19th century and early 20th century, the pre-Second World War period, by a kind of group of um, medical intellectuals, if you like, and intellectuals from public health who were all Marxists or, or fellow travelers because they couldn't actually join the Communist Party because of their because of their, you know, the threat to their careers, um, and how, how social medicine was conceptualized as a political movement, even in the Anglo-American context before the war, and became tamed um, in the Second World War. And I wanted to find out why, how that had happened. And I found the answer. I expected to find it in the logic of domination in the natural sciences. You know, I'm trained in the history and philosophy of science. Of course, that's where I looked for it, but that's not where I found it. I found it in exactly what Professor Bray was talking about, which was in the, um, the um, epistemological, the epistemological taming that results from the social sciences as the sciences of the social management of capitalism. And really what I discovered was, um, you know, that, that 
the legacy of August Comte, you know, Comte invented sociology in order to be um, a, management, a managerial tool for the, for the production of social harmony and the maintain, maintenance of, the, of um, existing structures of power. And I found that that legacy had profoundly, um, had profoundly extended into the post-war period of social medicine and right down to the very um, um, uh, methodological tools that were being used in a new kind of form, in a new form of what I called um, late uh, late modernist or late capitalist epidemiology, and and the reason that I um, uh, became so enthralled with Latin American so with the with a, a completely different model of social medicine was because in Latin American mod, in Ma Latin American um, uh, social medicine it remained driven by the politics of revolution. The politics of the revolution, uh, of, rev of, of, of revolution to eliminate political subjugation and oppression. And um, while, and, and uh, you know, Professor Bray just, out, just demonstrated um, how, the, how, how that history continues to produce, is, 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 is continuing to flourish. Um, in, and related to these incredibly important movements, I think, for university reform and actually looking at the, the role of, of, of knowledge and the production of knowledge in um, the maintenance or, or resistance to uh, the expansion of, um, I, I love the term greedy um, capitalist um, uh, 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 globalism. So I haven't got that much else to add, really. Um, to to uh, I certainly haven't got anything to add to to Professor Bray's um, um, uh, presentation. I should say that, of course, I now should absolutely move to Ecuador. So if you have a because I am an old Marxist, especially a disciple of the Frankfurt School of Critical Theory, and so you know I'm completely um, uh, you know. Uh, not at, at you know I'm not in tune with my uh, ki the kind of contemporary world of intellectualism uh, really um, in in the United in the United States or or, or um, in Europe. So I really should try I, I accept, try and um, apply for a job in um, in your university because <laughs> that's, com that's completely where uh, you know uh, my intellectual heart would 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 be located. Um, but that, that's the only thing that I have to contribute really here is to examine the logic of domination. You know, my work, all of my work has been um, an attempt to examine the politics of epistemology and the politics of um, political and social and historical tra uh, transformation. Uh, uh, the trans trans material transformation um, as well as cultural um, transformation uh, most importantly of course trans trans the transformation of structures of power and my interest in in um, the um, in, 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 in health and in, is in population health or in individual health is only related to that in, in, in the, to the extent that it reflects it, is the, it, is, it reflects produces and reproduces um, existing structures of power. So um, my, my contribution really is to examine the role of, of, of um, the, the metaphysics and, and epistemological taming um, of, of revolution, of, of, of emancipatory knowledge that emanates from the social sciences as much as from um, the logic of domination in the natural sciences. So let me let me hand over to you our next <laughs> Hello, thank you for being here. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. I want to present something more practical to add to those uh, uh, beautiful that may precede me. Um, I'm going to talk about, please, uh, pass it as uh, Latin America, social medicine in Latin America have uh, her presentation, her history, and people among them, Jaime Braille. Uh, as a Cristina Laurel in Mexico, um, but I wanted to add, I think uh, this is not the version of my paper, but I'm <laughs> going 
to put to put up with this. Uh, the short history is Venezuela Re Bolivarian Revolution, and here is Chavez, and he is uh, one of the representatives of social uh, uh, social medicine in Venezuela. Uh, Rodriguez Ochoa is a very well known in Venezuela, Pastor. And this is uh, uh, one of uh, another representative of social medicine. Is both of them have been minister of health in Venezuela when the beginning of the revolution. Pass it on. This is an, another uh, person of the social medicine, uh, uh, Francisco Armada. Uh, and I wanted to begin to say that, okay, here is the revolution, yes. Sorry, because of the mess. Again, that wasn't the the, the uh, presentation. But in 1992, 1993, cholera arrived in Venezuela, and that was one of the ways that you see the medicine. They represent the official medical treat people, poor people, uh, indigenous people, in special. You know, that was the the thing that people have in their mind to treat poor people. You know, here is a doctor and the savage of the poor people that doesn't understand medicine, etc., etc. Pass it on. There is Chavez. Pass it on. <laughs> Chavez was the one who put uh, health as a human right in Venezuela that had to be free, participatory, gratuity, you know, all of the dream of the people who represent social medicine, you know. And then came in 2003, Mission Barrio Adentro. I guess all of you have been here about it, about the Cuban medical and all the controversies, but let's talk about Venezuela, Mission Barrio Adentro. Pass it on. Cuban doctor, Venezuelan doctor, that not always were in this uh, togetherness. Pass it on. Uh, well, Jaime Priel has talking about social medicine in Latin America. I won't repeat that. But it's, 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 it's more than practices medicine. It's more than be with the patient and give the medicine. It's to know who this patient is, where he come from, you know, what is the situation that take him to be sick? That, in summary, is the core head of the social medicine in, in Latin America. Okay, pass it on. But Mission Barrio Dentro was created in the heart of the barrios in Caracas. This is a clinic, but it's also a house, a poor house in barrios in Venezuela. Pass it on, please. This is a doctor that was 24-7 in a barrio attending people. Sometimes they have free time and they can bring domino with the members of the house of the community. And that is the quality, equality between practice of medicine, doctor that empower, uh, well, red, sorry for the redundance, empower, you know, the power of medicine being an equal treatment with the community with the people, and that was the key for the success of Barrio Adentro. Barrio Adentro get more and more sophisticated, and then can pass it on. Uh, Barrio Adentro Uno, that, is, that was the basic interaction between doctor and patient, pass it on. Barrio, that was the environment of Barrio Adentro, more than 6,000 infrastructure like that, was emblematic of Barrio Adentro in Venezuela. Pass it on, please. Barrio Adentro 2, two, that was a, a high level where those people from the Barrio Adentro 1 can uh, uh, refer patients. Because the whole infrastructure of medicine in Venezuela didn't, uh, or let's say, wasn't in, in uh, a word for that. Uh, in, in col collaboration. No, no, no collaboration. Conflictio. Conflict. And then this came Barrio Adentro 2 that facilitate the reference and then pass it on. And they pass it on, please. Uh, uh, 
Chávez was against the, the insurance, the privatization of medicine in Venezuela. And he was, this was one of the, his pictures in, in, in his own website. He was against the insurance and privatization of medicine. Sorry for my hurry, but because I know that this is longer than I was planning. Pass it on, please. Okay. This is a para dentro have three levels and then becoming more and more sophisticated and more and more technologized. Pass it on. And this is the this is one of the center of reference, mm -hmm. Clinica Popular del Paraíso, and they have more sophisticated, more technological attention to the patient. Pass it on. All of this, one MRI was free for people. And you can get the numbers. You know, if the one MRI in private clinic is, let's say, <coughs> hypothetical, two million bolivares, and you can do a free in Barra Dentro, guess what? The owner of the private uh, clinical will be against Barra Dentro, yeah? Well, that's happening. That it was reality in Venezuela. They opposed all Barra Dentro, uh, even even the treatment. In fact, today I read the news. I didn't put in this slide that many doctors of private clinic in Venezuela reject uh, laboratory tests and in, in, in laboratory and in, in exam of this uh, technology because came from Barra Dentro. Mm -hmm. And they oblige the patient to go to their clinic to do it for amazing amount of money. Okay, let's continue, please, pass it. Well, Barra Dentro, like I said, was the balance, the equity <coughs> between what poor people in the barrios think about their need in health with the doctor that were willing to be there, belong to the be, be part of those parties. And they have this Comité de Salud, <coughs> Health Committee, that uh, were in permanent communication. And that was the success at the beginning of Adelanto. Pass it on. But Adelanto was integral. And I still try to be. If a person has a medicine, a prob medical problem, they were seen from the from the side. Well, maybe he don't take the medicine because he doesn't know how to read, and was a mission of of of, of the let me see Mission Milagro. And people doesn't know how to read. There was a Mission Yar or Mission uh, Educativa. Mm -hmm. They don't have a house. Homeless, Mission Repolita. I think it was all integration of what is the dream of the practice of medicine. Unfortunately, that was in conflict with the economical powers and the ideology embodied in the study of medicine. When we study medicine, I study some health uh, academic profession, we are embodying, we are accepting this uh, ideology that we have to be superior. You know, mm -hmm. we are the, have, the one who have the knowledge and the patient doesn't know anything. And that is conflicting with good practice of medicine and social medicine. And that's why Barra Dentro has uh, a lot of enemy multinational. You will find people here in the United States that doesn't know how to pronounce Venezuela. <laughs> they told me, you are from Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> but they said to me that the Barra Dentro is awful problem because the Cuban, the Cuban are there and you know, they don't know that. But this is the propaganda, the media that have contributed to have this Enormous conflict in the country. Pass it on, please. That's the last one. Yes. Okay. Finishing. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know, like what you say, habitus. 
we have to be careful. And this is my message for nurses and for all people, even anthropologists. You know, habitus. We are embedded in society that have the habitus of the power. And we are here in this university to learn how to exercise the power, how unconsciously be part of the state of the hegemony. But we have always, and here I will use what Jaime Berg says, use the term reconversion of our knowledge, of our reality, and the reality that we wanted to affect. I think I did it. Thank you. <laughs> How you all doing? I'll try to be real brief. I don't have uh, such pearls of wisdom, but I do have some practical experience that I'll share, and maybe that'll uh, help give a sense of what I might be able to contribute to the dialogue. And I'll, again, I'll be brief so we can get to that all important part of tonight, uh, which is the dialogue. Um, I am uh, with the National Nurses United. I'm a trade unionist all my life. I started um, in, uh, really cut my teeth as an organizer in the Black Belt South of the United States. Um, uh, Black Belt talks about the population that is there. It's a majority African American for sure, but it also geographically corresponds to the old plantation belt. Um, this back when I was there in the 80s, it was still very much an apartheid environment. Black uh, majority populations um, and uh, uh, white majority local governments, exclusively white governments. Uh, and the struggle in South Africa was happening at the time, and the contrast and the parallel was, was pretty obvious to folks. So um, there was really no access to health care at all. Uh, for in many of these counties, 50, 60 miles, no hospital, no clinic the public health department, not even a doctor's office. And this was also the area where a lot of factories were, were located, particularly poultry factories. Prior to that were textile factories. And, and we see a convergence here that I think is very interesting. Um, uh, and certainly the labor history of the United States. Uh, a lot of the organizing in the South was what began around health issues. For example, in textile mills, the brown lung problem. Um, and some of the organizing, some of the pioneering organizing in the South in the 70s was around organizing around brown lung. When I, when I was uh, there more in the 80s and the, the poultry plants were taking over, the textile mills were largely shutting down, the problem was repetitive motion injuries. And my comrades and I were trying to organize, we're trying to figure out a way to organize and really the clearest way, the best way was to address people's primary um, uh, concern, which was they couldn't use their hands anymore. Women couldn't pick up their babies. They couldn't comb their hair. Severe problem. So we tried to organize uh, clinics. We did. We organized rural screening clinics with local community organizations. These were the concerned citizens groups, which were all over the South at the time. And these were black organizations. And they were basically like parallel governments. Very fascinating history, little known history in the United States. And with these groups, we organized um, these screening clinics where on a Sunday or a Saturday, we would have uh, these free clinics. We would organize students in the university, physicians, to help precept. And um, w at the time, we, in order, there was such a demand for this that we wanted to not only expand it, the network, um, uh, which we ultimately did, and we formed an organization of all these little clinics around the uh, multi-state area called the Community Health Collective. Um, uh, this is in about 1984. Um, but in order to make them not only broader but permanent, we had to figure out, um, we, we, had, we had to confront the resource problem, and it's beautiful to hear about Barrio Adentro because that is a situation where you have ideological I, you have ideology, ideolo I, clear ideology, you have clear purpose, an ideological perspective, a class perspective, and you have resources. We didn't have resources. Most, situ most struggles do not, you know, the resource question is really a central thing. So what did we do? We, at the time, uh, we had South Africa. 
we had El Salvador. The Salvadoran uh, liberation struggle was at its height. Mm -hmm. And we studied how did the Salvadoran mm -hmm. liberation forces create a medical healthcare mm -hmm. infrastructure, um, humble as it was, in times of war in the liberated zones. And what they were doing is they were training lay people to, prov to do some of the basic things, freeing up the more skilled staff to do the more complex things and to do more training. And where did they get it? Well, certainly they learned from others. The Cubans played a great role. Um, but they, before that, they, they studied the Chinese model, the barefoot doctor model. So it really kind of, you, you know, I, 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 see, I saw through my own experience a lot of commonality here. Um, and really as an organizer, uh, and here's a central point I would like to leave you with, is that the, the power of organizing around healthcare issues, such a fundamental human need, to, to lead to broader social struggle. In the, in the subsequent years in these communities, these community organizations ultimately took political power. If you go to these same towns in the rural south today, you'll find black majority local governments. Um, it's a profound change that's taken place in the United States. Um, and these health clinics were part of that. Um, uh, we also, also for developing cadre, for developing other organizers, organizing around healthcare, around this basic human need, is a very, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful and perfect entry point to get into broader social struggle. And that is certainly the approach we take in our trade union work in National Nurses United because of the work our people do, taking care of people at the bedside one at a time. They confront the medical system. They confront social injustices. They understand why people are there. They know who they're treating, particularly in, in the poor communities. Um, and what we try to do, and I think Chris laid this out at the beginning, is we try to take that experience and amplify it so that we can not just advocate for the individual at the bedside, but advocate for health more collectively, which by necessity requires engaging in broader social, political struggle, environmental justice struggle, economic justice, racial justice, uh, and, uh, and basic uh, democratic struggles. Um, and if, I, I dare say, you know, we, we're a fairly successful union. I think it's because we take that approach, quite frankly. Um, we're dealing with the question of industrial power, but not as an end of itself. It's part of a broader struggle. And we also understand that we have to organize and we have to build allies and we have to build a social movement or we'll never solve the problems in the hospital. It doesn't end just at the point of production. It's a broader embedded social, mm -hmm. social uh, 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 problem that we're dealing with at the bedside. Um, and then just finally, uh, a, a piece of work that we're doing now, oh, let me just say this, just as a, parenthetically. Speaking of the trade union movement in the United States, which is in crisis, if every union took this approach, where they took their work, right, and they took the industrial struggles and saw how they're embedded and tried to involve their membership in seeing and in participating in broader struggles to see the commonality and the interrelationships, for example, of teachers, any, particularly in the social services, but any field. Imagine mm -hmm. the power of the trade union movement in the United States and the, fo and the role that it would play today. Just think about that. Now, finally, one of the things that we're doing that I'm, I'm very um, excited about um, in National Nurses United is working with allied um, uh, sister nurse unions around the world in this thing called Global Nurses United. And what we're finding is that we're certainly not the only ones. There's a lot of people that have this uh, perspective, nurse unions. Uh, some 28 countries now are involved in Global Nurses United from around the world. I work particularly um, with some of the Latin American affiliates in Honduras, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Peru, Uruguay, Paraguay, Brazil, and Mexico. Um, um, and we're beginning to work more with the Cubans. I hope we'll, we'll continue that. And what we're seeing is that um, despite very different conditions in the countries, there's a real commonality, and nurses play um, always the same role in <laughs> certainly advocating for our patients, but it, it ne ne necessarily leads to a broader struggle. For example, in every country in the GNU, and certainly in the Latin American countries, it's the nurses, 
often allied with the other health professionals, but always the nurses, almost always the nurses. They're at the front line demanding access for marginalized communities. More health services, broader health services, more resources, the resource question in the rural areas, in the indigenous communities, in areas affected by environmental devastation and climate change, and in the marginalized communities in the cities. It's the nurses. Our sisters and brothers are always at the forefront of that. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is defending public services that already exist. One of the things that's special about Latin America is there is a, generally speaking, a collective approach um, to healthcare infrastructure that we certainly don't have in the United States where it's completely atomized, it has a totally different history. And now in the, in the neoliberal era, it's, it's the unions, the healthcare unions, particularly the nurses' unions, that are defending this public sector. Um, and you'll see that across the board, often in alliance, sometimes very nice coalitions between the other various professions, but the nurses are always there. So there's, there's a, there's a um, by, by, by walking that road, the nurses see um, uh, what has to happen in society and therefore the potential for engaging in broader social struggle is tremendous and for, for, crea and for, uh, for um, being an example to others also is, is tremendous. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. And the last presenter is Dr. Luther Castillo. And good afternoon. This is the more difficult presentation I have ever made. <laughs> I think uh, being here and to be able to speak after those brilliant people, and um, I'm trying to look the way how to clone Professor <laughs> Jaime and take him to Honduras to the National Autonomous University after they have been convert converting the university in the last year as a battle of oppression against its critical thinking of the students and it's but we have a brilliant students over there fighting for the right and fighting for to rebuild the new country for the most needs people when I think most of the great things have been said this afternoon I just want to share with you a small example of what uh, we are trying to do and in the underserved areas of Honduras. And I born in a, a very <laughs> far and underserved area in Honduras. I invited my good friend Adrian to visit me sometimes. But I, I invite one of my friends from Cuba and he told me, that, oh no, you know, when they, they thought at Latin American School of Medicine to go to the, uh, you know, to go to the remote area, but this is like a hell, he told me, you know, this is too remote, how we can do and provide healthcare care in this beautiful, in, in that, that area, and those community with lack of access to education, lack of access to health care, and we can have a long list of lack of, but it's a community full of joy, and, uh, um, Bodies of solidarity, sharing with each other, children walking to the school without shoes. Then, uh, in my case, I had to walk. You know, my, my small village it was un until sixth grade. I had to walk three hours to go to school and three hours to return to do my seven, eight, and nine grade every day. That was the daily. Then the grandma had to wake you up. You know, you know, you have to wake you up before the grandma wake you up because mm -hmm. <laughs> before. 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning, they prepare you some lunch and walk and go to school because their deep pride, it was sending us to school and saying, oh, you have to be better than me. Then, then but in December's journey, what we have to do when somebody gets sick in the community, when a woman is in problem in labor, then we have to take it take them in a, in a hammock. It's a big, just a big stick and a hammock that was our ambulance in that area, you know. And uh, then we, then my father used to encourage me to take, no, you have to, we have to volunteer as my, with my brother to take those people who were sick to the next community who was five hours. Then there were no doctors over there. They just, uh, it was a small clinic of uh, a religious sister who they do everything. They have some knowledge about nursing. They do everything, surgery and different things. Then we used to take those people, women and people when they have some injuries and work in the lines they, and traveling and we have to work in. They have some injury, we have to take them by hammock. One of the big difficult things is when you walk like a three hours, you know, almost there, four hours, then the people die. 
then you have to return that. Then, then the people just to say that the the you know person when he's dead is is more heavy. Mm -hmm. Then you have to return. We have to return back all those situation was right there recorded in my childhood in my mind. Then there was the genesis of what I would path to go to med school and become a doctor. Then. It was difficult to say that I saw some doctors in my village with a white coat, and uh, <laughs> there was no doctors in those areas. But it was that was the genesis to try to uh, to do this journey. Then we start the 1998 in, in November. The, the Hurricane Mish uh, destroyed part of Central America. Honduras was one of the most affected country. Then the Cuban. Uh, send the first medical brigade to help in the underserved area of Honduras. And one of the great particularities of those brigade, they didn't went to the capital, they went to the underserved area. It was something that very great and big impact for our people because our mothers, our grandmothers who worked the field, who worked in the land, that was the first time in their history they were treated by a doctor without a big distance, you know. They touch them, examine them, they don't care about how the people smell, how they can dress, then they will ride there working for the poorest of the poor. It was very interesting uh, situation and process that was going on in those in the server community. The first time the people didn't believe there is a doctor here, living here, but the other side is visiting me at home and there's something well what what the doctor is doing here in my house. You know, it was something when the poor said the poor, the system custom them to get the last. When you have the big pie in front of the table, you're still looking for the piece of bread to grab from the table. But this is something very interesting. Then we got the opportunity that we offered, they offered those scholarships to the young people from those areas. Then I was the first one, I want to go. I, I wanted to study medicine first. I went to the capital, I registered at the university, but I had to work in the morning and go to school in the afternoon. It was difficult for me to advance because the classes are in the morning and the labs are in the afternoon. It was, it was really hard. Then I came to this scholarship. Then, and, uh, then I, I moved, uh, I was ready to go to Havana. Then uh, the news was uh, about those scholarship, but they were saying that we had to go and cook cane every day and, uh, and go to school in the afternoon. Then I take my boat, you know, bam, I take some of my, you know, the same, uh, what I was using to work in, in, my, in my village, I take it to Cuba, then I had to return it back in my first vacation because I, they never sent me to Kurt Kane. What I found there, it was a full of solidarity and great professors and willing to provide you the best knowledge that you can. That, that was a great opportunity for the poorest of the poor. Then the opening of Latin American School of Medicine in 1998 provide us uh, the opportunity to dream in Garifuna, in Embera, in Maya, in Quechua, and many other languages for my brothers and sisters, which today Latin American School of Medicine become the more largest medical school in the world, who has been graduating more than 25,000 young people from 124 countries. Then I'm heading to Havana tomorrow. That was I'm excited to meet to our Congress, our second Congress of doctor graduating from Cuba. Then, after when we arrived to Latin American School of Medicine, that we, there is something that we have to move on and move forward because the poor people, we don't have too much time, you know. You know, the life expectancy in our countries are 48 years for, <laughs> for men and 51 for women. Then that means that when we arrive to med school, we already made like more than a half of our trip around the sun. We don't have too much time to, <laughs> to lose. Then we move forward and say, what are we going to do? Before we come, we're going to be six, seven, eight large, large year, years here in the med school. What we're going to do today before we, then we organize as students and we, we put some students together. Then we're going every vacation, we're going to donate our vacation to go to the most remote area and work with the people in the far remote area in the country. Well, we, but, but these people say, but what do you know about medicine? Then what are we going to learn this year? Then we're going to apply this year. Then what do you know? Then you, you, you learn to take blood pressure. Then you go and take blood pressure when you arrive to the village anyway and tell the people they, they don't have to eat too much salt, they don't have to do this, you know, but you know, you don't know nothing about pharmaceuticals, but you can approach and do some prevention of medicine. Then we moved, then we went to those remote areas 
and uh, and work with people, and it was something very, really, really, really interesting there. And uh, in my village, I arrived in my first vacation. The people were thinking I was a doctor. You know, I left like uh, people doesn't know about <laughs> traditional <laughs> academia. Then, then, then you left from the village. Then the people think that that you are you are a doctor. Then I have a uh, I had a great opportunity that. And next to my house, there was a pregnant woman. She was ready to, to deliver. They invited me the day before I went and take her blood pressure. It was good. <laughs> then I said, hello. <laughs> so I did my job. Then, then my cousin invited me to other village. Then I went to other village to give a, a small talk at the school about, uh, about medicine and culture. Then I went there. Then the same day that I left, then this woman started in labor and then that process. Oh, they, they ran away to my house. They were looking for me. I was no there. Oh, thank God. Then, I, then, <laughs> then they went to the midwife in the village. Then, then the midwife, you know, solved the problem and saved my reputation. And when I returned the next day, I went to the midwife and helped them with some new uh, attention. But it was something uh, interesting. And, uh, and say that then we, when we arrive there, we say we're going to organize those group of students. We go, the next one, we're located in those areas without electricity, without running water. You know, there's a steel engine today. My village, they, they don't have electricity. That's the condition of women. And uh, they, ha they have to transfer them in this hammock for all five hours, get to this canoe for another three hours, and get to a place where they can ride in the back of a car. And six, eight hours, you can ask Mr. Gus Newport. He just arrived and his wife arrived from, from Honduras. He was former mayor of Berkeley. You know? He was with there with me in Honduras. But that's the way. That's a 14, 16 hours to get to the nearest hospital. That's the, um, the things that as a young people who are thinking we cannot wait anymore to try to do something. Then we started to do this work. Before the graduation, the second one, when we were thinking about that's the way how to get to those villages is difficult. You know, there is no road then you have to go and travel like this, the next one. Then, then we were thinking about how we can create an alternative model of healthcare. Delivering in developing country, not only in, in Honduras, because we had the opportunity in Latin American School of Medicine to have students from many, many, many countries. Then we, it was a great space for us to think, share with each other, but to become a, in a conclusion that we have a common history. You know, we have a common problem, common enemy, and we have to look for solution in common. That's why. Then we we, we think about those. The, yeah, you continue. We think about those three elements. How to develop human resources for this new alternative model of healthcare, uh, develop a creative mechanism of building healthcare infrastructure, and the third one is the most difficult part of it, how we can build continuity and sustainability into that, into, into that process. Then, we start with the first one, we say with human resources, we already have the opportunity of the scholarship for many young people, Latin American School of Medicine, then, then we have those, that's solved with the human resources. And the second one, we mostly have the country, the Latin American at that time, they had a Cuban doctor working there. Then we have a space for those students. When they go from vacation, send them back and work with the Cuban doctor and do voluntary work right there. Then one of the other elements, it was trained doctor. When they finish, what are we going to do? We say we're going to return that doctor to the native communities, with their community. Then we develop in City Warrior Honduras an example and, and sign an agreement with a Cuban medical uh, 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 university to develop a residency and family medicine right there in the villages. Right there with the Rifuna people, who is the only Afro-indigenous community in Honduras who still speak their own language. And um, then well, it was a very great uh, model of example how the doctors return back to the community and do their training in the community. But they, are, they were expected to train more midwives, auxiliary nurses and promoter of health inside that community, you know, taking this approach, a biopsychosocial approach of medicine, taking in account the cultures and, and uh, moral values of those people in that community. And of course, and try to build those international collaboration, you know, to be, to try to. The next, it was one of the most difficult, it was how we can build infrastructure without money, you know. You arrive to a community, you are young, you just left from there. People know that you don't have money. You just left. <laughs> and you come in 
Lynette, now two years after saying that, well, we're going to build a med medical facility here, we're going to provide, we're going to build a program, the people think that this guy talk about tradi like traditional politicians who arrive here every four years, you know, <laughs> telling us that they're going to build a bridge and we don't have river, then we, then, <laughs> and then we, when they recognize that we don't have river, they say, we don't have river, how are you going to build the bridge? They say, we're going to build the river too. Then, <laughs> then you saw like, uh, like those traditional people, what? you know what you got to do? Some people were thinking, <laughs> Those guys are coming from med school with some <laughs> some mind, the problem of mind, how we can we can treat them. But we develop we, we start to work with people and go house by house. Women the key Mo element machine to move out this process. We went to the women's organization and the community, they organized their home by whole house by house, house by house, talking to the people how much they you will give to work for that. Then we were crazy over there looking for bricks and different other thing materials and we developed this sophisticated community voluntary structure, each house of the community to donate 10, 14 uh, day of work to deliver and work in the community. As you see, there was something we passed the next we, we pass, we pass. <laughs> I'll just show some picture regarding the time. As I remember this meeting, it was the first meeting in the community talking to the people. And this first meeting, they said, let's give this crazy guy a piece of land to see how he can do. Then we go with the community and clean the piece of land and build the first hospital over there. And we were providing medical care in this area and talking to each people about this new area because it was good to show the practice then women, children, and as you see, everybody involved in, in this building their own destiny. Then this building, it was not only an, uh, uh, an uh, example to create an alternative model of healthcare, but become like a monument of dignity for the poorest of the poor. Then we, we launched this process, then we are expanding the facility, we are uh, providing more healthcare, um, just show the picture that that was the first born, you know, first child who born in the facility. It was amazing, interesting. He arrived there, his mom, it was 72 hours in the process of labor, you know. She was coming, she was coming 48 hours from Jerusalem and arrived to the place where we are. And but she was a little bit far from the city. Then you have to decide what you have to do. The traditional way that they teach you that you have... You, the woman is almost dying. You don't want her to die here inside the, the hospital and register her and one of who die here, then send her, refer her. <laughs> that is traditional way. Right? Do a paper. You know that she's going to die like two hours after before they go, but she didn't die here. You know, she died in another part. Then it was something interesting that we applied. Then we do, we didn't have surgery room. Then we do a physiotomy and save the life and, of, uh, of the woman and save the life of the, uh, the baby. It was something really amazing. I saw this baby like he was six years old, you know, going to school. It was something amazing, interesting. And we go, that's the way that we organize this. this we set up 11 a small a small clinic that just doctors living in the community, taking care of people, giving workshop, attending house by house, attending people in the nine. And this, you know, we open a small hospital and nurses at school. We're facing many problems now with the sustainability of this, but 20 single mothers to go and learn and train as a auxiliary nurses. You know, I, I trust more nurses than doctors, but I, we can talk about this. <laughs> then it is next, that's gonna be our expansion. We, we're building now, we're going, you know, trying to expand and try to get, this is our projection in the future, like a part, this is just a one example, we just opened the second hospital, a small hospital in a community of Colinas, who is run by a mayor and community of Caminas, Santa Barbara, the government just hit us and took 10 of our out, she took out 10 of our doctors, <laughs> then now we had to reduce part of our service now, almost like, almost 50 or 40 percent, you know, then um, they, we had like a 11 Cuban doctors working for us for all those years. The government just changed the agreement. They took our chapter out. Then um, we are inviting all of you to join us in this uh, special journey and continue to build hope for the poorest of the poor in those remote areas. Thank you very much. So thank you, everyone. This was amazing. The panel, this whole event ended 10 minutes ago, um, officially. So I think either we have time for one question from you or one question from me. And then there's snacks in the back where you can ask questions of individual people. 
Um, but I, we don't have time for a lot of question and answer. So if someone has a question that they're that burning to ask that will help kind of move forward, I welcome it. Otherwise, I have a question to ask. Either one is fine. So, yeah, if the panelists could come up here. My question for whoever wants to answer it is twofold. Um, given that the history of Latin American social medicine and collective health, um, barrio adentro, et cetera, has had major like steps forward for health equity and social justice, and given that there's been strong pushback against it, in, you know, Clara, Dr. Clara Mantini Brings talked talked about that. You've talked about that. Um, what can we here do in solidarity with Latin American social medicine, and simultaneously, what can we learn to do here from Latin American social medicine? And then, then we'll eat snacks. Huh. <laughs> so I don't know if no sé si quieren empezar. Jaime Braille is taking notes because he's he's preparing for his response. <laughs> and maybe if you could stand up with it, when you talk, that would be great for the people who are videotaping you. Well, I, I will begin sort of, sort of uh, saying that uh, it's not what we can learn from Latin America. So although we have struggled and we have uh, a lot of, a lot of try, try to do the poor people, the patient, what they deserve, that they, 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 the the service that they deserve, and more than that, you know, be equal, be collaborating. But it's a struggle. And and what you were telling about the nurses, uh, uh, in, in global nurses, you know, it's a struggle. You know that our enemy is a common. It's not only from Latin America. It's it's a fight that we all have to embrace. That is my taking view. My colleagues want to say something. You know, I think uh, we, like, uh, <laughs> leading uh, this kind of project, we lose many time and uh, small things that we, because we have to solve, uh, right there in the practice when we are dealing with that, we have to solve everything. We have to decide if we, by, by, by uh, t uh, $10 of medicine, or provide the gas for the doctor to eat, right. or provide the food for the doctor to eat. But it, you have to make, like, those... <laughs> So a small thing, but hard decision to move forward, you know. And very interesting process that I learned, and sometimes we have to push it like a mathematical, this is the y-axis, this is the x-axis, and the y-axis we have the actions, but in the x-axis we have the, uh, the legitimacy. Then dealing with the system is already established, and when we are building like an alternative, <laughs> you know, model inside this, this collapse system, but there are lots of people who defend it. The, the structure, you know, is already there. And uh, one of our biggest situation what we face is to say, no, we cannot approve your project. This is illegal because it's private or it's public. You know? mm -hmm. No, it's not private. It's not public too. <laughs> you know, it's not public because the, the concept of public is because the government is the finance of the of the you know, it's, it's belong to the people. Then how we can introduce new terminologies inside that established system. But what, what the, the other part of it is because you join, you challenge the system showing that you can do how much you can do for, with nothing. Then the people start to say, why well, the government is not doing nothing with all the money and the corruption that it's doing, then you become dangerous. Then our project was declared illegal and when, when we start. But we spend too much time, I think, doing those actions. When we do the action, automatically we have a reaction. Mm -hmm. Then we keep pushing over there a lot of actions, but you have to learn that we have to build some legitimacy too. Mm -hmm. Then and the and, 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 and international alliance, the global alliance become a, le a legitimacy too because mm -hmm. back home become like the way to protect and different other things. Then the same what we have to face program with. Uh, then I have some. I I, I have like uh, six f female doctors who were and. and uh, uh, doing voluntary work with me and, and three of them get pregnant that we had to look the app for them another part because we didn't have money to pay them. You know, they were very brilliant but we had we had to take a decision and do different things. Then we had to spend a uh, times as those maybe uh, small things but very hard decision for us to move forward. Then the solidarity 
of uh, sponsoring some of those programs are going to be like very interesting or giving making some alliances with some of those programs are going to be very interesting to keep supporting and moving forward. Thank you. See, I think what the common theme is is, is the it's a, the common theme. It seems to me um, <coughs> is the the politics of, of um, the collective praxis. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why I think the term from Latin American social media of collective health is the most important, it's the most important lexicon, really, um, um, in terms of, um, you know, its inherent critique of the, of the, of the structures of power mm -hmm. of, of um, capitalism and in terms of its, um, its imminence, its, its uh, inference for um, actual practice, for translation of of um, you know of uh, of a, a culture of, of a cultural level to a material level of of political praxis, and I think that's what's I think that's what's the, that that's what the lesson is. Um, you know the the practice of of um, integrating in, in indigenous knowledge with um, a non indigenous knowledge. Um, the the praxis of voluntarism. Um, with uh, rational organization. Um, I think that that's the, the most important lesson that we've, sort of the commonality between um, all the discussion today. I think it's important for us to reflect on one, one important issue, uh, that health, the health field, the health struggle, is not only, it's, it's, it's very important in terms of health services, of health care, but it doesn't, it doesn't end there. It goes way beyond that. So even though, of course, the first range of actions has to be related to health services provision and equity, but I think we have very other urgent, urgent needs in health that, that we have to... It's very, very difficult to answer in abstract terms your question, but I think that in terms of practical scenarios of struggle, that's where we meet strongly. That's where north-south, south-north mm -hmm. relationships are profound. Uh, I think that um, one, one basic thing is to team up. We need you, and I think you need us. We need you badly, and you need us badly. Because this, this is a world, an endangered world. And if we are, if we are wise enough, we will understand that that, uh, and this is a struggle I have back home, that there is a threat, uh, an important thrust of, of, of decolonization and uh, destroy, destroy every root that you might have of Eurocentric knowledge. And one of the Eurocentric knowledges would be Marx. Mm -hmm. One of the Eurocentric knowledges in, in, the, in, 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 this, in, the, in the arts would be, you know, who knows, Picasso or, 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 or Beethoven or, or or Schubert, and that ridiculous, that ridiculous uh, thing, I think, is because we are human beings that are struggling against a world controlled by capitalist reproduction, which is destroying the whole world, north and south. When we see the kids with autism in the north, and we see the kids with autism in the south, we see cancer in the north that that shouldn't be there, and and and, and north south. So it's an endangered world. It's not only a problem of social justice, environmental justice, it's a problem of species survival. Mm -hmm. And when we have such creeps in, in, with so much power, mm -hmm. I think that uh, both North and South, I think we have uh, many things to do. So one of the things came up. I think, and I think we can mutually refine our plans and instruments. We need you. For instance, I have a brand new laboratory, high-tech laboratory, that I struggled for it seven years, and I have it there. Last, last uh, generation, or recent generation technology. But I need the North, strongly the North. And I think that uh, that's, uh, that would be a field uh, kind of thing to team up. We, we, have, we have been thinking with the, with the Brazilian nurses to start a doctoral program in critical thinking nurses. Okay. So boy, that's another 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 scenario to team up. Mm -hmm. We should team up. And I think <coughs> imagine, let me dream. Sao Paulo University in Brazil, Berkeley and Universidad Andina Simon Bolivar in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Doctoral program, international doctoral program in critical nursing. My God, I can't I can, I can imagine what things we could do there. No. So I think that's another thing. And, and um, well, there are many, many things, but one, one thing that is enormous is the absolute uh, corporate control of bibliography. Mm. Peer review, the, the dictatorship of peer review, and, mm. and the control they have, and the enormous business that they converted, public, public funded knowledge into private mer merchandise for, for capital accumulation, which not only destroys our small budgets in the South, but it, it, it puts Harvard in, in, in big trouble because, I mean, how can you pay four million dollars only in bibliographical subscription? So it's a, it's a monopolistic control of knowledge. And I think north, south, south, north, we can destroy that monopoly. So that, that's the sort of thinking that I think we have to really get busy in doing. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, we, we know that Berkeley is a space of democratic knowledge. But I know that it's endangered. <coughs> it's endangered because your history of, 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 of democracy, of a university that is, that is critical, is endangered or is already, is already being destroyed. And it, this is also north-south. So many things to do today. <coughs> with all those words with remembering that this is an endangered planet that we all live on together and that we need to team up to fight capitalism and protect the earth um, thank you all for coming thank you the California Nurses Association and National Nurses United thank you Adrian Pine, Chris Nielsen Carlos Martinez for organizing um, Deborah Lustig and CB and Charles Briggs for being part of organizing and thank you all for coming and eat all the food or take it home because it's there. And remember that tomorrow at 6 p.m. in the building that's easier to find, called Clover, Jaime Brill will be talking about environmental, toward environmental and health liberation.